uh, we'll get right into the questions here. Uh, thank you all for being here. I know that the rescheduling with the snow uh, cut our numbers down uh, dramatically, but uh, greatly appreciate you all taking the time uh, to be here. Uh, talk about really an important issue that's facing the legislature here in Kansas and in other states uh, this year. Every legislative session, as many of you know, is uh, really uh, one of the headlining issues is always the budget. Often, though, there is another one or two issues uh, that really becomes a marquee issue. 2009, uh, that issue was energy. It had to do with the, uh, if you remember the issue, the Holcomb expansion uh, uh, power plant that was blocked by the uh, Space Administration. Part of the deal uh, to unblock uh, the expansion uh, was the renewable portfolio standard. Uh, that's going to be one of the, the main issues that we're going to talk about here uh, shortly. Uh, RPS, renewable portfolio standard, essentially is uh, it requires the state's investor-owned uh, and cooperative utilities to, in the years 2011 to 2015, 10% of their uh, generated uh, energy or the purchased energy has to come from renewable resources. Uh, in, in the years 2016 and 2019, it's 15%, and by 2020, it's 20%. Uh, with that, I, I might also add, too, that if you drive west of Garden City, uh, so how, and uh, you drive to Holcomb, you will notice that that power plant has not been built yet. In fact, I don't think that uh, the ground is even broken, but we still do have this uh, renewable portfolio standard. There's a, a my first, I'll ask the first question to uh, Chairman Dennis Hedke, uh, who is a geophysicist. So he has, he comes at this from a, a, an angle that I think, uh, a scientific angle as well that, that I certainly can't come from. Uh, but it does a, a great job as the Chairman of the House Energy Committee, Energy and Environment Committee. Uh, so with that, there's an effort this year to repeal the Renewable Portfolio Center. Where do you see that going? Well, Joe, uh, first of all, I really appreciate everybody coming out. Can you hear me okay? Is this volume about right? Okay. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background to answer that question. Speaker Ray Merrick is sitting over here to my left. And, uh, really good leader of our house. And the word repeal didn't come up until I was sitting at a luncheon with Ray and some other folks in Wichita back in front of the luncheon. And he highlighted that it was, it was one of his objectives to repeal the RPS this session. And we're, we, we can joke about that. He's, he's, he knows this story. Uh, it was a couple weeks later that Senator Susan Wagle, President of the Senate, also indicated that sort of preference and, and so the, the groundwork was laid, if you will, to try to uh, work on that strategy and, and that, that goal. Uh, as Jeff alluded to, we're, we're looking currently at a 15% nameplate capacity requirement by 2016 or the end of 2015 and a 20% nameplate capacity, renewable nameplate capacity by 2020. And most of the utilities in Kansas, frankly, have already moved past that 15% number. Scott Jones is sitting over here nodding his head. Mark uh, Schreiber is nodding his head up and down. And, and so in real terms, the, the action that's already taken place by the utilities looking long term down the timeline uh, puts us where you know the the next goal, if you will, is, is that 20% marker, and and so the, the, one of the realities uh, that I look at, and not everybody in the room is going to agree with me on this, but we had a hearing this morning in my committee that, that spoke to the president's climate action plan and our resolution in the house the state's disagreement with that plan for a variety of reasons. I'm not going to go to all that detail here today, but, but we had a vibrant discussion, pro and con, on that, that concept. The President's Climate Action Plan would place substantial additional burdens on utilities, on ratepayers, on businesses, 
from on board the United States of America if his objectives are executed by the EPA. And, and so the EPA is now looking at what they want to try to do to accomplish those goals and objectives that the President has stated. And, and I, first of all, I find great disagreement with his climate action plan in terms of the metrics he's using and the things that he states need to be done and why he states them need to be done. And that's scientific and that's technical, and I'm just not going to go there here tonight. We did some of that in the committee this morning, and, and that was a very interesting discussion. But my view of this whole thing is that if the EPA, acting on its own recognizance more than a decade ago, had not floated this idea of renewable portfolio standards across America and started strongly encouraging that through their mechanisms, that we wouldn't be here talking today about the RPS in the state of Kansas because they were the initiators of the concept, believe me. And we bought it through Governor Sebelius in 2009, and, and there was a deal that was structured to, to relate to that. And, and so promises were made, deals were cut, and a whole for plan was laid out. And the next thing you know, we had the renewable portfolio standards and the mandates that related to that. And that was off to the races in 2009, and now we have seen the results of the EPA, the RPS, the redundancy required to go with that to build out and support when the wind doesn't blow, and ultimately the transmission grid that also has to be expanded materially to meet that electricity output. So those four factors together have contributed to a 40% increase in electricity rates for a great period of the state of Kansas on an average, 60% in KCPNL's track area, and people are feeling this pinch in a very, very large way. And I'm hearing from fixed income folks, and I know that other legislators are as well. And, and so there's, there's logic, I guess is my point here, that would lead us to at least seriously consider what the history has shown us and where things could go if we don't attempt to make some sort of change in the structure that we currently have in the state of Kansas. Uh, so I, I, I would submit to you that it's, it's worthy of our reviewing it and looking at the data, Westar has been very uh, helpful in sharing their current status with us. I've looked at that history and, and we have projections that, that would relate to that. Uh, so I'm certainly available to, to analyze and, and to consider where we ought to go. So the legislature's concession, as you all know, and we're, we're looking at all kinds of things that relate to this, but, but my emphasis has been, and it will be, that the EPA has overreached in every respect across an entire range of business spectrum activity, and they have so far accomplished it in relatively unabated terms. And the RPS is one of those things. So I'm not happy with what they've done. I think most of the people in this room are not happy with what it has done to American business, American livelihood, the pressure that's put on our economy, and, and the reality that we're dealing with based on their strategies. And this didn't just start overnight. This started, frankly, 40 years ago. And they have been slowly but surely meeting their goals and, and arriving at a lot of conclusions, which I think are scientifically very unsupportable. So, as a geophysicist, I'm not going to stand still and just let them go with, with what they want to play with until they've proved their concepts and they have not done that. So, thank you. That's a long way to question. <laughs> Next panelist is James Taylor. James is a senior fellow at the Heartland Institute. Uh, he's also the managing editor for Environment and Climate News. He's really been a leading free market voice uh, in this discussion across the nation. You may have seen him on CNN and MSNBC, uh, Fox News, and, and CBS. Uh, James, from what I can tell, the discussion right now across the country really seems to be, the trend in discussion seems to be towards repealing RPSs. 
Is that what you're seeing? And how many states have an RPS? Okay, uh, before I answer that question, first of all, I'd just like to express my admiration for the uh, legislature here in Kansas because in some states, joking publicly with the speaker here could be uh, uh, very risky. But, uh, <laughs> Obviously, we have a good enough relationship here that you can feel free to do that, so that's wonderful. And it is wonderful to be back in Kansas once again, and certainly one of my favorite places. Uh, regarding the renewable power mandates, and, and oftentimes, you know, battles are fought over language. So when folks want to impose renewable power mandates, they don't want to say renewable power mandates. They say renewable portfolio standards, so that if you're picking up the newspaper or watching the evening news, you have no idea what it means, but it sounds good. I mean, everyone's in favor of it. It makes our, our environment clean or whatever. They don't tell you you're being required to purchase a set amount of renewable power, and even that term we can we debate and discuss. But what's real encouraging is that, uh, as Dennis mentioned about a decade ago, when you saw the momentum for these renewable power mandates in the states, and we have 30 such states right now with those mandates, the momentum has changed, and no longer are the proponents of the renewable power mandates playing offense, they're playing defense. Uh, I, I would be very surprised if we don't see some states at the very least roll back and perhaps outright repeal their renewable power mandates in the not too distant future. And it's, it's, it's highly unusual now for the proponents of renewable power mandates to gain any traction for imposing a mandate in a state now that does not have one, or even to strengthen or tighten or further restrict the mandates that are already in place. And that's very encouraging to be playing offense rather than defense. And the reasons are very simple, and I'll keep this short because I, I know we want to uh, have more interactive study. But here in Kansas, since the renewable power mandate took, took effect, our electricity prices here have risen eight times the national average. Uh, when you look at the 30 states that have renewable power mandates during the past five years, their electricity prices have risen double the national average. When you force people to purchase more expensive energy, and I have nothing against wind power, solar power, you name it. What I am interested in is people who pay the bills, people who pay the taxes that also you know, fund the production tax credit for wind power, et cetera. But when you're forced more, when you're forced to purchase more expensive power, you don't get that for free. There's no such thing as a free lunch. And I think people are finally starting to realize and we're seeing the real world impacts. And in states like Kansas, uh, legislators are saying enough is enough. And I think for when people talk about the, uh, the stakeholders, and they talk about they get the environmental activist groups together, and they get big business together, and they forget about the biggest stakeholder of all, and that's the citizens of the state who pay the taxes and have more burdened by the renewable power mandates. And it's wonderful to see here in Kansas and elsewhere, uh, uh, Representative uh, Hedke here doing tremendous work to bring these issues out front and perhaps finally stand up for the citizens, the ratepayers, the taxpayers. All right, third panelist is Landon Stevens, who is a policy associate at the Institute for Energy Research, another uh, a great resource I encourage you to check out on these type of issues. Landon, what do you see that trend being as far as states repealing RPSs? Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah, well, it's like James said, you know, a lot of the states are kind of realizing they're falling now, and so they're looking for those, <laughs> those discussions to start beginning on, on how do we repeal this or, or walk back. And I think an interesting example that we can look at is, is Europe. Um, um, a lot of times, those on the other side of the argument like to claim, you know, we're playing catch up to Europe. We're behind the game with our environmental standards and what we're trying to accomplish. And they want us to look at them as some kind of, you know, pedestal, some kind of goal to reach. But what you're seeing there now is those same type of mandates in renewable energy that were set out there ahead of us give us the perfect example of what we have to look forward to. So as James was saying, you know, states with these uh, RPSs, they average about 40% higher energy costs than those without it. And now you see countries like Spain and Germany, who are the supposed leaders of this, actually turning back to coal, right? And they're considering fracking and these things that would have seemed just completely ludicrous not too many years ago. And so I think that's giving us some um, courage, I guess, at the state level to start looking at how do we maybe think about this in a little more rational way moving forward. Representative Benke, uh, a lot of the opponents to the RPS do so because they say it's the government picking winners and losers, uh, and that it's not a free market solution. It's difficult for me to look at the issue and, and see a free market piece of the RPS. I don't see it, maybe others do. 
What are your thoughts on that? Is this government stepping into the energy policy where they should not? Well, I, I would certainly believe that had the government not stepped in and taken you know, the actions that they have taken statewide, federally, and so forth, that we would not be where we're at today. I think that, that it just not to pick on one industry, but that since renewable power in Kansas tends to equate to wind development, there was action in southwest Kansas more than a decade ago where wind farms were being produced and created in Gray County, for example, and, and the technology was being tested and, and some results were gathered and, and they were frankly struggling mightily on their own recognizance. And on the other hand, when the mandates were passed, the world changed dramatically for them even with the production tax credits, which had been in play uh, since before those build-out activities were being accomplished, they were still really having a hard time with the technology and, and making it run on its own basis. So from where I sit, the mandates have materially altered the landscape. And I have certainly talked to utilities, many of them, currently within the last month and I'm hearing from them that you know there there are distortions in their portfolios in terms of how they address the grid, how they deliver the power, how they manage that on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's going to change a little bit when we go to day ahead markets on March first, but but it has materially impacted I think the, the overall structure of the market. And and so uh, they're trying to make some winners, and and I think that you know that that does play itself out in some very different uh, scenarios and and rates. And we've had about 18 rate increases since about 2009. And I'm not going to belabor that point, but that's just what's happened. And uh, so I I got to say that it would appear to me that the actions that have been taking place of material marketplace. James, what are your thoughts on is this government picking winners and leaders? Oh, absolutely. With an out of the mandates, you would not see most of the wind farms that you see currently in existence. Right now, wind power supplies about 3% of our electricity nationally, and that was not the case before the mandates. You were talking more about 1%, and there's a reason for that. Uh, when you look at the cost, uh, the production cost of wind power, it is about two to three times more expensive than conventional power. And that number, it, it's one that has a lot of input factors and people will try to you know, pick, and, pick, pick at the bones in terms of exactly what it is. But it is, it is more than double what conventional electricity uh, generation is. And interestingly enough, the U.S. Energy Information Administration they project the levelized cost, in other words, when you strip away the tax incentives, et cetera, of the various uh, electricity sources. And they say that for, what they do is they project out for new facilities built this decade, they'll project out over a lifespan of 30 years what the cost will be. And according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, keeping in mind that wind power folks say, oh, we're so close to being competitive, we just need a little bit of a boost and we'll be there. But even looking 30 years in the future, they still project that wind power is going to be 50% more expensive than conventional electricity. And even that is really cherry picking uh, at the, uh, for the benefit of wind power. Because for example, they assume that wind farms are going to have a 30 year lifespan. When we know that wind turbines don't last nearly as long. We're talking more than 15 or 20 years. And we also know that natural gas and coal power plants last more than 30, but they assume that those facilities will only last 30 years. And various other things. When you look at in, in the real world, the price of wind power, the price of solar power, you are talking at least three times the cost of conventional energy. Now, we could have a debate in terms of whether as a society we want to encourage that, 
But I suspect that when the facts are out there, when people have access to the facts, they may say that wind power, solar power, sure we're in favor of it, and they often aren't told about the real environmental costs of these uh, forms of uh, electricity generation. But when they know that for every increment of electricity that they purchase, it's about three times more expensive than what would be the case otherwise, uh, then folks are not going to purchase it, and, and we're not going to see this market unless we have governments stepping in with mandates and or subsidies. So it certainly is government picking and choosing winners and losers. Otherwise, uh, the, in the industry wouldn't exist. Hey, now let's look at the uh, production tax credit here for just a second. Uh, that tax credit was put in place 20 years ago. Uh, it's had, as, it was put in place as a temporary propping up of an industry to get it going 20 years ago. And uh, it's had seven extensions. And currently, can you give us an update on that? And give us an update on that. And also, what do you think will happen to the industry, industry in Kansas if that doesn't indeed go with permit? Yeah. <clears throat> so, I mean, it is interesting you talk about the extensions. I mean, it seems to me that's kind of the trend with most taxes, right? They always promise a temporary thing, and somehow they always keep getting uh, extended. So right now, the PTC, you know, is kind of on the chopping block. It's kind of in limbo. That never seems to last very long, right? There's always some bill at the Capitol that, in D.C., where they try to attach it to a rider to get it pulled, pulled forward. And, and that may or may not happen, depending on the, the politics of the time. Um, and that's kind of the point. It's never really about the, uh, you know, the effectiveness or is this good economic policy. It seems to be more of a political, political play. Um, Kansas is an interesting topic, I guess, now that, you know, that we're here today. Um, we recently put out a study that kind of looked at the different states individually and who were the winners and the losers at a state level with the win uh, PTC. And, and Kansas, I guess you could say, in, in that study comes out as a, kind of a winner or a taker um, in the sense that they were, they made a hundred, and this is looking at 2012 numbers, so they made just over a hundred million dollars um, from the PTC, the wind producers did, um, and Kansas residents, as it's a federal tax, right, um, paid about 24 million. So they came out with about a 77 million dollar surplus. Uh, to put that in perspective, the biggest winner or taker was Texas, um, and they ended up over 300 million um, with their win. And Kansas is actually, when you look at wind potential, should be right behind Ken or right behind Texas. They're second in, in wind potential. But really, it goes to a point that James made. You know, while you may say that's good for Kansas, right? Those that tax is coming from somewhere else. Um, and most of the time, it's your, your rate payers, you know, your everyday people, that's money coming out of, out of their pocket. Uh, and that's something to keep in mind. So while we have this federal PTC that's kind of propping up the wind industry that tends to focus here in the Midwest, um, you have 31 states that are taking a net loss on that to benefit the 19 states that take advantage of that tax credit. Um, but overall, I just think there's more efficient ways to put that money to use in the market that you know that don't lead to these distortions that raise electricity rates and, and do all types of things. So, as far as what would happen in Kansas, I don't know if I'm qualified to say what would happen to the whole industry without it. But from an economic standpoint, I don't see many places in the country that wind could be sustainable on its own without that kind of uh, support from the federal government. Can I add something here? Um, it's very important to keep in mind, and Landon brings up a good point. He talks about the winners and losers in terms of uh, the subsidies. And while certainly Kansas would be taking more than giving in that particular subsidy, but it's very important to keep in mind that that doesn't encompass all the costs and all the benefits. So Kansas may be taking in more in terms of the production tax credit, but with electricity rates as a result of this extra wind power generation going up eight times the national average. And by the way, if, if, if the electricity prices in Kansas, since Kansas enacted the renewable power mandate, had risen merely at the national average, right now the average Kansas household will have an extra $500 in their pocket 
and it's cost the Kansas electricity consumers as a whole over $550 million. So we've had a $550 million tax hike, and we're not even getting anything in return. When the government collects tax revenues, we might get new schools, we might get more teachers, et cetera, but when they force us to purchase more expensive electricity, we get nothing in return. So maybe maybe in Kansas, you're getting a little bit more in terms of the, you know, the give and take of the PTC, the production tax credit, but it still does not make up for the additional costs that ratepayers are paying across the board. So it still means that Kansas is on the net end a loser, even though in the, the one isolated uh, subtopic of the PTC, you might be taking a little more than you're giving away. Still, as a whole, Kansas ratepayers, Kansas taxpayers end up losers as a result of this. Uh, back to the Representative Henke, who are the, the proponents of the, of the RPS, and what is the rationale that you've heard for having them? The proponents of, of the RPS? Well, uh, I mean, there are multiple uh, entities that are strongly supportive of the RPS. Uh, that would be Wind Coalition uh, and a number of other associated groups that, that uh, work with them. Uh, I don't have a, a agenda list here to, to state. Uh, Specifically, but but there are uh, a number of entities out there that are very interested in ensuring that the RPS stays intact, and, and they're working very hard to accomplish that. And I appreciate that competition, uh, uh, but I think that you know we do have a difference of opinion in terms of what it means to the state, uh, to the country, and. And we'll continue to have this discussion, and we hope that that you know, we, at the end of the day, what we want to do is the best thing we can possibly do for all the citizens of the state of Kansas. And one of the things that I look at, and this is not the only thing, but it's it's just a quick metric to consider. There are about 1,736 wind turbines in the state of Kansas. So, okay. And it's coming from about 20 wind farms. So who's receiving the main benefit from that activity? The landowners upon which the turbines are placed and their heirs. Uh, and so maybe there are, I don't know, 800 families. Divide that 1,700 by two. So you got about 800 families which are really substantially receiving a material benefit from the royalties and the leases and so forth that they're uh, receiving from that, that activity. And yet we've got 2.9 million Kansas citizens who are all experiencing these dramatic rate increases. And there are, I don't know, out of 2.9 million citizens, how many of them are fixed income and below the poverty line and, and what they're experiencing and the pressure it's putting on them in terms of the reality of our delivery of this newfound electricity. So I, I look at that and I've certainly heard from a lot of those folks uh, and I, I just say that, you know, the proponents of the RPS, I would suggest that you consider that outcome. I would say that most of the RPS proponents would probably also be, you know, wanting to bring benefit to those people that are at least able to support themselves. And they're creating the exact opposite outcome. So, I don't know how you justify that. I don't know how you weigh that out on your scales, but that's one of the things that I look at. Landon, let's turn very uh, briefly to, to the issue of net metering, which also passed in the 2009 uh, legislative <coughs> session. What is net metering, and, and where do you see it going? Yeah, so net metering uh, is an interesting topic that's kind of moving around state by state. Um, I'm most recently from Arizona, and so I got kind of really into the net metering argument as that, that kind of grew there. Um, and I know in Kansas there's been some talk recently, I think it got tabled for a while out here, but net metering is essentially the idea that homeowners with solar panels who are generating electricity should be able to sell that excess electricity back to the utilities. Um, and I think it's important to note, on that point, I don't think most people would disagree. Right? If I'm an electricity generator, I should be able to sell it back. Where we take issue from a free market perspective 
is what is the fair rate that those homeowners should be paid for that energy. And right now, they're being paid what we call the full retail rate um, in most of the states where they're talking about net metering. And what that means is the utility who is forced to build out infrastructure, power lines, transmission, power plants, and provide services for these homeowners um, to have power while the sun isn't shining, right? Um, there, there's no room for them to recover any of those fixed costs. And so from a utility standpoint, you know, it's, it's affecting them, but where, where we see it as a major problem is the cost shift from one consumer to the next. So those added costs aren't just being eaten by the utilities, but they need to be recovered by the rest of the ratepayers who don't have solar panels. And as Representative Hecke was just saying, we talk about kind of the regressiveness of, of what that does. The people who are benefiting and the people that are being negatively affected, negatively affected tend to be, you know, the wealthier homeowners on one side who can afford an expensive solar panel array, and those that are being hit hardest with their raise in electricity prices every month are lower income families, right? And so there's a lot of different dimensions to this argument that I don't think get, get kind of reflected on properly, um, and states are really starting to see it as the numbers in solar panel customers go up because solar panel prices are coming down, new leasing schemes are being um, brought into the market, which is a whole other argument to talk about, but um, I think it's one of those other things to look at nationally along with the RPS is what's gonna happen with net metering and how do we really determine a fair price to pay these homeowners that can work for all parties, right? The neighbors that don't have solar panels, the homeowners with solar panels and the utilities who have to provide these consistent, reliable services, you know, with all of these different changes to the market. So. Great, with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to John. We have about 20 minutes now, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, take questions from you all, for a Good. John, can you repeat the question? I, I kind of forgot. There's eight different renewables under the mandate. Uh, do any of these, or any of them, reliable enough to think economically, economically for the base load? Well, I'll start. Um, are they reliable enough to become economically viable competitive? I'll tell you that I would hope that all of these potential energy sources uh, were to see costs come down or to become competitive. I think more competitively priced uh, energy resources are better, but government can't wave a magic wand and sprinkle pixie dust on them and make them all of a sudden economically competitive, and that's the problem. When you, when you look at wind power or solar power, the energy is, is very diffuse. It's not very concentrated. And we'll often hear, well, the wind blows for free, the sun shines for free, so of course we should therefore be using wind and solar power. But it takes a tremendous amount of resources, it costs a great deal of money to turn that into usable, and you hit on a key term, reliable electricity, because we don't know when the wind's going to blow from hour to hour, or even minute to minute, and therefore we still have to have backup coal, natural gas, etc. generation, which by the way now operates less efficiently because it has to ramp up and down to match the intermittency of the wind. It's like driving a car in the city as opposed to the highway. It's much less efficient than going up and down. So getting to the outlook, well, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, for what it's worth, as I mentioned, projects out the cost over the next 30 plus years for facilities that will be built this decade. So taking into account uh, new advances in technology, and they say no, not only no, but heck no, not even close. You're still looking at uh, uh, probably in the real world about three times the cost of, uh, of conventional power sources. And just one, one other point before I turn it back over to other panels here. 
the, the term net metering. Remember at the beginning of, 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 when I, of my remarks when I mentioned our renewable portfolio standard? Unless you know the topic, you have no idea what it means. Does it kind of ring a bell with net metering? There's nobody out there that reads a newspaper and knows what it means unless you explain it to them because what it is, it's a set aside for small solar power uh, you know, home generators. They don't want to tell you that. It's really interesting. I don't have much to add to James' uh, observations in terms of viability. Uh, I think he's covered it pretty well. I did want to say, uh, first of all, I forgot to say thank you to AFP and to Heartland for composing this entire uh, opportunity to come together, and we deeply appreciate that. So, the state chamber. Yeah, the state chamber, of course. So, anyway, go ahead, and if you want to add to that. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, no, I, I think he hit on <coughs> Excuse me. The main point there is the. Give me a second. Marco Rubio. Well, I would, I would answer the question about viability in terms of solar power for what we've nationally experienced in the last few years. Solar price points have certainly dropped, and, and that market you know, opportunity for some people is improving. Uh, but the government certainly got involved in a big way in some places like Solyndra, and, and we understand the difficulty that, that uh, resulted from that governmental commitment. And it's in this RPS sense that they were developed in the first place. So uh, wind power costs have certainly come down. The cost of turbines and, and the construction of the towers, people have figured out that equation and they're doing a lot better job in terms of that cost relationship. And we appreciate that. Uh, but levelized cost, as James alluded to earlier, is a really important factor that we, look, we need to look at as we examine the true cost of installing that power and the benefit that comes out of that. So I would say that that, that still has some work to be done in terms of really materially adding in a really economic way to to our electricity grid and where we go to the future. So <laughs> Yeah, I think that was pretty much my point is most people don't realize when we do build these uh, renewable uh, you know windmills and solar panels, the intermittency of those means that they have to be backed up by a traditional energy source, which right now is natural gas, but you know, as James was saying, we don't know what that's gonna look like necessarily thirty years out. Um, and, and how that's going to play. So I think letting the public understand, you know, beyond the punchlines and the, the talking points of how great renewables are on their own, the, the logistics of what goes into bringing those, you know, from the middle of, you know, a field in Kansas to your home, there's a lot that goes into that to make sure when you flip a light switch, your power is there and it's reliable for you. So. Thank you. Uh, so the facts that I have are we've had 19 rate increases over the, since 2009, 40% uh, for Westar customers, 60% for KCPF customers, uh, and the panel said $500 million out of the taxpayers in Kansas. Is that accurate? And how can we assess that to wind, EPA, you know, there's all kinds of figures out there that I'm not sure which to believe. Uh, is it all wind? Is it EPA? Uh, is it just the cost structure of Westar? Uh, could you enlighten me on that? Thank you. Well, uh, first of all, the, the number that I cited for KCPNL is not their entire Portfolio. I think that was a relatively limited piece of that. And Scott, is that correct? But that's the pressure some folks in the KCP now service area are experiencing. Uh, and, and so, to the, the answer, the other, the pieces that are fitting into that that range of increase, RPS is one of those. EPA is another, about equal amount contributing to that. <clears throat> Redundancy is a smaller piece, but the transmission is probably the greatest part of that, that fourth part. 
combination that is related to the rate increases. So uh, we can't control the EPA. We certainly could change potentially some action on the RPS addition, which would relate to transmission, which would relate to redundancy. So you've got three factors that we do have some ability to, to relate to, to react to. Uh, and you know the EPA is just a whole other thing, but it's a significant part of that, that portfolio pressure going forward. And, and if there's anything we can do to ask them to be more reasonable with regulations and be more responsive to the real market, I'd say that that does relate to the question. And, and we're trying to open that debate and put some you know, thought processes back in their life in terms of what they're trying to do to the industry. Their, their overreach is significant and they don't seem to do much in the way of cost-benefit analysis. I don't, don't understand how they get where they get and a lot of the claims that they make in terms of saving asthma attacks from ozone and other things that they claim that the result from the cleaner energy portfolio that they want to create, uh, I'm just not buying it. And the data doesn't support it at all. I mean, I'm going to give you one example. The state of California, 2009, started a baseline study related to ozone and asthma events in hospitals. And what did they find in 2012 after three years of research? No correlation whatsoever between ozone emissions and hospital events related to asthma. None. Zero. No correlation. So they make a claim, but they don't have the data to support and they won't give you the data. So, you tell me, does EPA have anything to do with cost structure mark? They, do they affect your life? Scott, I mean, they do. And so, you know, they're their claws are sharp and deep, and we have, a, I think, a responsibility in this country to put some cards on the table and let them know that we're paying attention, and we're paying big bucks to pay attention. <clears throat> so I'm not going to apologize to them, ever, and, and that's my position. So. Getting to those numbers, some of my think tank allies, they accuse me of being too overly optimistic regarding whether it's global warming, renewable power mandates, et cetera. Because I'm always, I'm always optimistic that ultimately truth is going to win out, ultimately markets will prevail and consumers will benefit. And the, and the reason why is that nowadays with, with the technologies we have, with the internet, uh, with, with the data that's published that anyone can access, we don't have to wait for government bureaucrats to give us, to deliver us the information in the format that they like, with the message they like, we can go and find the information ourselves. And I think that when people have access to that knowledge, that's when the American people are smart, the American people can figure it out, therefore we're going to make wiser decisions. So getting to the question, is, is the information accurate? How did I obtain it? The U.S. Energy Information Administration, they have a website. You can Google search EIA state electricity profiles, or better yet, EIA electricity, electric monthly. And you can go back and see state by state and the nation as a whole what electricity prices were, were, were for every month of every year going back as far back as you want to look. So what I did is, as I looked at the Kansas numbers, since, you know, starting with the date that Kansas enacted its renewable power mandate, we compared that to U.S. electricity prices over the same time. And that's how I was able to discover, I'm not Wiley Coyote super genius, I was just able to go onto their website, compare the numbers. And then you can also look at the fact that Kansas has increased its wind power from about 6% to 20%, and you have other factors. There are some factors that also impact, but really when you think about it, with the, with the cost of natural gas going down so much, U.S. electricity prices as a whole really should be declining. It's gone up about 3% since 2009. It would have been going down without those uh, EPA costs, etc. But when you have states with renewable power mandates that require more expensive electricity generation, it's going to go up even higher than that. So the numbers are from the U.S. Energy Information Administration. I'd be happy to send you, you know, links to exactly where they are if you send me an email, jtaylorheartland.org. And in Environment and Climate News, which is our monthly uh, publication from the Heartland Institute, it's available online at our heartland.org website. I actually have an article where I break down these costs 
for Kansas and the nation as a whole. You can find that as well. And he has a follow-up question, I think. Well, I did. I realize I'm not arguing with the numbers, but I'm paying every day. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. I, I appreciate sympathetic questions, but I even more appreciate, like, questions that contest it, and yours, I could tell, wasn't. But I want people to, if they have an issue, if they, if they don't understand, or if they are, they're going to pick a bone at it, I'd rather pick a bone in public so I can respond to it or maybe clarify. But yeah, the numbers, whenever I give a presentation, whenever I'm like here or somewhere else, I always use numbers from the federal government, the resources that they can't say, well, this is Heartland Institute's own studies. Mm -hmm. Believe me, we put out excellent studies, but I want to make sure that people who don't agree with us can't say, well, they're just doctored data. But anyway, yes, the U.S. Energy Information Administration, you can find it online, and if you'd like to find out specifically how to get it, just send me an email, and I'll send it your way. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Mike Camille of Kansas Chamber. One of the reasons why we uh, agreed to be at this month is because of the primary importance of this issue to the business community. And my, my question really has less to do about the business community, which is I can argue with that. It has to do with whether there's any data, and maybe you'll send me to the website, but our private or our public sector partners, the schools, the hospitals, the regents, universities, we hear a lot from them about the rising energy costs as well. Has there been anything that's, that's maybe uh, public sector or you know, specific to uh, how this all plays into uh, the climate of the cost of public sector? I can address it, but I've spoken so much if anyone else would want to do it. Well, I mean, I, I think it's just important to remember that these, these mandates affect everybody equally. We're all paying the same electric rates, you know, barring any tax incentives or different things. But um, so our, our public services and our public uh, organizations are going to be hit just as hard, right? And so that's schools, that's um, hospitals, different different services that we count on. We're all affected. Um, and, and I think it is important to, to point out how it does affect our commercial and industrial interests as well. These mandates drive up the costs of energy uh, which is especially harmful to those businesses that are energy intensive, which a lot of times is manufacturing and, and these heavy job creators. Uh, and I talked about using uh, Europe as kind of an example to see what we could be headed for in the future. Uh, and one of our studies showed that in Spain, which was kind of taken as the, the leader on this, when we looked back at, at what their uh, green economy looked like, after a few years in, when things started to unravel, we found that for every green job that supposedly was created by these um, subsidies and mandates, they actually lost over two jobs, about 2.2 .2 jobs for every one green job that was gained. So in our public sectors, it's going to have an effect, but also in our corporate and industrial, it's going to, energy prices affect everything that we do in society. And so it's important that we get the message and the, the messaging and the language across that people in every industry, whether you're at home with your family, you're in the boardroom, uh, or you're you know, working at a public level with a school or a hospital, that we all understand the effect that this, these have on us. And the U.S. Energy Information Administration, whose numbers I draw upon, uh, they will break down the electricity costs and the changes in terms of residential, manufacturing, et cetera. I haven't seen it broken down to public uh, institutions, but you. But I, it's interesting to, to point this out. Oftentimes, you'll see in the news where there's some new solar facility or wind power facility, and they talk about how much they're going to generate, how much electricity at peak. In other words, when the wind's blowing at an optimum range on those rare occasions, or when the sun is hitting just right on those rare occasions, and then they talk about, well, it's only going to cost the average ratepayer a dollar fifty a month on their electric bill. That's because they're only talking about the average consumer, household, non-business, non-industrial, et cetera, where you have so many of those costs borne, as is the case for our, our schools and, and government services, et cetera. And that's something to keep in mind. Whenever you hear this, it's only going to add a buck fifty a month to your bill. Well, they're forgetting about how you're going to be paying higher prices across the board for other goods and services because they're paying so much more and they're using so much more. And that's how they hide the cost. And what's real interesting also, anecdotally, in South Texas, there was a story in USA Today about two weeks ago. You had a school system that's primarily people of Mexican-American heritage, dirt poor, uh, but as a result of hydraulic fracturing uh, in the region now, 
The, as opposed to in Spain, Landon talked about how unemployment's going up because they have these renewable power mandates, because it's a tax across the entire economy when you raise uh, energy costs. In South Texas, because of the increase in energy production, actually competitive, uh, efficient energy, natural gas, oil, etc. Now you have these school districts where you have these dirt poor children of immigrants where now they have surplus money. They're buying them all their own personal computers and tablets and they're getting new schools and teachers. This is a difference between encouraging energy that is affordable, that makes sense, and encouraging energy that doesn't. And actually, I would argue government shouldn't be encouraging either one. But I use the term encouraging loosely to mean taking the shackles off of conventional energy production. And yes, schools and others will benefit just as consumers, personal consumers will. Great question. We got time for one more question. Thank you, Jerry Mullen. Uh, there is for any, any of you, what would be the potential or the prospects for uh, moving to uh, deregulation of utilities, very electric rates in Kansas, and, and the potential for savings? And, and is it giving ideas based on what other states have done and what they realize in the savings? <clears throat> I looked you for potential to make that change. I could talk about the cost of my problem so much, spoken so much. Well, uh, the potential to deregulate Kansas electricity rates uh, is under study. Senator Jeff Melcher is in the audience here. I know that Jeff's been working on that uh, issue. <clears throat> so I don't have any comments at this point to state whether it's going to go forward this session or in the near term in terms of Kansas taking another swing at that. Kansas did take a look at it uh, a number of years ago and the conclusions that were drawn at that point in time indicated that it, it probably wasn't going to be something to, to take forward. Uh, we do have California, we do have Texas, we do have uh, some mid-east states the also incorporated deregulation and they're uh, working with electricity. Uh, it's working better in some areas than others. And, and I would say that, that you know the matter probably does need to be more seriously studied and, and you know, we, we've got to take some time here to, to really fully evaluate it. Um, <coughs> California hadn't worked so well. Texas doesn't really work so well either in terms of rates going up with the consumers where they thought they'd go down. Uh, but uh, Ohio, I believe, is one of the states that, that has had some relative success with it. Uh, I think it does depend a little bit on your portfolio, how you create your electricity, how you deliver it. Uh, so there are quite a lot of factors that, that come into play to, to really uh, see whether it's going to be a good fit for your, your state or your region. And Kansas, some of you in the audience would know, is a part of a nine-state region that's called South Southwest Power Pool that really manages electron flow across parts of the United States. And I think they do a pretty good job of that. Mark and Scott, I think you probably agree. Uh, it was created some, what, 10, 12 years ago. And and it's actually undergoing some transformations and there may be some new states that are added to that that mix in the next year or so. South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, part of Montana. Right now it's Kansas, Nebraska, Oklahoma, part of Texas, part of New Mexico, part of Colorado, I think, part of Arkansas, part of Louisiana, and part of Missouri. They're all a piece of that Southwest Power Pool, which if it doesn't reach up to North, North Dakota, you got good chunk of the mid-continent region of the United States are <coughs> participants in that South of the Power Pool. Uh, and, and so if DREG comes into play in some way, then you know, that's that Southwest Power Pool I'm gonna guess is gonna be part of that discussion and, and how you, you know, move electrons across that whole grid is gonna be another part of that discussion. So it's kind of complicated and I'm gonna leave it to the other guys that are a lot smarter than me to figure that out. In terms of the, uh, the savings, the economic benefits, 
And let's all swing for the fences and say a repeal of the renewable power mandates. If we were to have that repeal, well, as I mentioned earlier, since Kansas enacted its renewable power mandates, electricity prices are going up eight times the national average. As I mentioned before, uh, that's an amount that over the four years of the, uh, the mandates has cost the Kansas economy 557, I believe, pretty good with numbers, let me double check, 557 million dollars. Uh, divided over Kansas is 1.1 million households. Uh, that's uh, approximately $130 per household per year that's being sapped away for no good whatsoever other than the jack of energy prices. So, and it's funny because when I go from state to state and I present the numbers, because it's the same last year, I testified in Ohio, I testified in, uh, in Kansas here, I testified in uh, Colorado, et cetera. Every state I go to, it's the same thing. They always try and say, well, how do you know that there's not something else going on here? Or maybe it's just more an outlier. No, that's the case in every state. The states that have renewable power mandates, their electricity rates are going up twice the national average. So what's going to happen when you repeal that? You have a $140 million per year stimulus package for the state of Kansas. Each family in this, in each household in Kansas is going to see an extra $130 in their pockets every year. Think about the economic benefits of that. And when, and when you look at the, the flip side, when they talk about environmental issues, don't get me going on that because according to the American Wind Energy Association's own numbers, it requires the development of 300 to 600 square miles of land to replace a single natural gas power plant. But the fact of the matter is if you repeal the mandate, if you allow the most affordable, efficient, common sense, uh, free economic uh, energy sources to prevail, we will have an economic stimulus in this state that we have not seen in quite some time. And I think that'll make everybody happen, happy, except for perhaps a very small group of vested interest in the wind power industry and environmental activists that don't really do their homework and look at the environmental consequences of wind power. All right, well that uh, concludes this session. Uh, we're gonna have dinner here in just a second, but before we move on, I do wanna recognize a few folks in the office uh, in the audience, uh, in addition to uh, Representative Dennis Hatcher, we also have mm -hmm. Senate President Susan Blagel, Speaker of the House, uh, Ray Winger. Mm -hmm. Senator Forrest Knox, Senator Jeff Walter, uh, Senator Michael O'Donnell is in the hall, as is Representative Dan Hawkins. Uh, we also have uh, Representative Jerry Lunn, Representative Will Carpenter, and Representative Sue Boulder, and finally Representative Rob Hiley. And Senator Larry Bout. Michael O'Donnell, Dan Hawkins. Just stay seated and we'll get